Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. Hey folks, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I really showed up on the internet at Gnome Dex here in 2005. I'd been on the internet for a while, and there were all these people who were doing things. And I was like, I'm one of those people, but I don't know them. So I came, uh, and, they were, and they were all going to Gnome Dex. So I was like, I'm going. And at the time, I was a school teacher. Uh, I'd been teaching for six years. I was making 29K, and I saved up. It was, it was more expensive back then, I think. And uh, I saved up and came, and it was basically the beginning for me of my life on the internet. Um, I met Steve Garfield and KK and uh, Scott Beal and a whole, the whole gang of people who really beca I became friends with and helped guide me. And, um, and just so if you're Twittering, I can't Twitter right now. So if you want to just let the internet know that um, we're back, you could do that and uh, send them on Ustream and that kind of thing. Um, if you want, you can follow me at, at Brie or uh, my machine company Twitters and it announces new things in the shop and crazy things that are happening, you can follow MakerBot too. So, you know, we were promised flying cars. Yeah. <laughs> we were promised space colonies. We were promised jetpacks, and we were promised a machine to make anything we wanted. So, I can't really do anything about the first three yet, but uh, I've got the 3D printer part nailed, and I made it so that you can do it too. I make things, I'm obsessive, I'm my life is dedicated to supporting people's creativity and making things. And so, um, recently I started a company with two friends, Zach Smith and Adam Mayer, uh, to make MakerBot Industries, and we make machines that make things. And we make it so that you can make them too. So. What is this contraption? What is this thing? It's a 3D printer. And by that, it's, an, it's basically a machine. And you send it a, an STL file, which is kind of like a text file for objects. And it, it takes it, and it slices it up, and then prints it out. Bonus points if you know any of the people in here. That's MC Frenelod and R. Stevens and uh, a few other of my friends. So the nice thing is, like, I just, I just took it on the airplane. I just walked it over here. I set it up out there. I just pulled it, pulled it out here. Up until, recent, like, up until this year, if you wanted to print something out in 3D, it's very likely you had to go to a, uh, a place that was either a, a company that did design or an exclusive institution, and it was mainframe sized. It was like the early days of computing when if you wanted to use a computer, you had to go to the college that had the computers and enter the room that was seriously air conditioned. Same kind of thing. We're in this wonderful place. This is kind of like the Apple One of 3D printers where you can buy it as a kit and put it together. And it's, uh, it's just in the same way that the Apple One ushered in a time of uh, personal computing. This machine brings a time to you of personal fabrication and manufacturing. So the way it works is you download things. This is a, uh, Google actually did a pretty good job on their, uh, the license for the Google um, warehouse, which is an object place. And you can, if you, you can just download them, you can do whatever you want with them, basically. There might be a non-commercial part to it. I have to look at it again. But you, this is, I downloaded the Empire State Building, and then I built it, or I printed it. And um, it's an additive process. So a lot of people are like, oh, is it cutting things? And it actually, no, it builds it up layer by layer. So it, it builds it up layer by layer. Oh, and you know what? Um, it really helps to feel these things. So I'm going to just, uh, I'll just pass these things around. One is a little box, and one is a unfolds head. You can just pass it along. Um, uh, unfold is. Uh, we, we, I'll tell you a little bit about Thingiverse. He somehow got a scan of his face and uploaded it to the internet uh, to a site called Thingiverse, and I downloaded it and printed it out. So um, it uses plastic, and it's cheap. Uh, it's about $10 a pound. You can make a lot of heads with a pound of plastic. And when you're done, you can just print more. These are actually uh, parts that we the machine actually prints out parts for itself. We have these pulleys, and 
we, we originally made them out of laser cut wood and then we were like, we can print these. So, so bit by bit, we're actually printing more um, parts on the machine, which is fun. And we actually just did this whole thing where we're actually asking people who already have MakerBots. We didn't have time to run our MakerBots because we're like busy packing boxes. And if you have a MakerBot, we'll actually pay you to make parts for other MakerBots, which is pretty cool. Distributed manufacturing. People have been talking about this whole idea of like crowdsourcing, but as far as I know, nobody's done it physically, and we're the first ones to basically crowdsource our, you know, our, the, our, our, our machine. Oh, so let me show you a little video. Oh, let's start that over now that the, you can hear the music.
Yeah. Um, if you know me, you know I do lots of video, and I've been so busy packing boxes and things, it was really great to have a friend come in and shoot that video. Okay, back to the presentation. So, um, so the, like uh, about a week after they brought this over and did this, they uploaded them to, they had just kind of done it as a challenge for fun, and they uploaded it to this site um, that my friend Zach and I created called Thingiverse, which is, it's kind of like YouTube, except instead of uploading videos, you upload uh, things, design files. And they, upload their, they uploaded their design files and pictures. And um, they got, you can't see it in this picture, but they got like a ton of comments and interest. And they had previously just thought they were gonna do it as like for fun. And they're like, you know what? We're actually gonna go into production on these things. So I really, one of the cool things about this is by sharing their design, they ended up getting a lot of feedback and, uh, and, being, and really kind of tested the viability of it as a, as a product for them as designers. So uh, Thingiverse, I mentioned, it's this place that we made up to share things. And um, it's so cool, like every day people upload new things. Uh, Dominic is in here, uh, came over and he's like, have you, have you printed out my skull? He had gotten a CAT scan and, got, and got, made a file of his, like, his actual skull, you know, in case he needed another one someday. <laughs> and, uh, and we just printed it out. Uh, and it, it turned out it was a little small. We need to make it bigger so it's more structurally sound. But, um, you know, bonus points for, for being able to print out, you know, your body parts. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I really have to talk to all of you about it, but uh, there's so many people who still haven't figured out that sharing is the best thing ever. Um, you know, for me, I've, and everything I do that has any value, I share with the internet. And I do this for a few reasons. One, uh, I believe it's important that uh, people be able to build on what I do. And another reason is because there are children out there who have to suffer through school. And the school really these days is not about uh, inspiring children's creativity. There are amazing teachers out there. I was a teacher for seven years. And, um, and these days, kids are having to find their passions outside of school. And if you can share your passion, whether it's making things or whatever it is, and share it online and, and let people find it, they, they can be inspired by that and they can build on that. And actually, I'm pretty sure that's what's going to replace schools in the next couple of years. So, uh, but one thing I find is I tell designers, I say, hey, you've made some awesome things. Upload those things to the freaking internet. And all sorts of questions come up in their mind about, um, like, if I give it away, how will I make money? If I give it away, how will people know it's mine? Somebody will say it's theirs. And uh, I think, I mean, those, those arguments are all relevant, actually, because like, the idea of sharing is a way of you know, building brand equity, letting people know who you are. If you do it enough, everybody's going to see it. Like when you see an Eames chair, if you know anything about, if you're a furniture nerd, you know it's an Eames chair. You don't have to see that they you know, signed it. Even if it's a fake Eames chair, it's still an Eames chair because they pioneered that type of uh, um, furniture. So just share. I'm just going to keep saying that. So yeah, I just said that. Uh, there's also this idea of maker's marks, you know, making things your own when you share. And back in the day, before there was the internet, whoa, uh, People like made things, and they usually had like signed it in somewhere. There was a little maker's mark, especially with jewelry. And this is another way of saying like I'm setting this free in the world, and yet I'm still claiming you know attribution. Um, so if you have any digital designs, don't let them suffocate on your your desktop and your hard drive. Like upload them, and if they're object files, like upload them to to Thingiverse and. If there's stories, upload them, obviously, to your blog and so on. Uh, it's really cool to be here. Uh, just to step back, you know, when I was first here in 2005, the most exciting thing was podcasting. And audio had arrived on the internet, and it was the most exciting thing. And Adam Curry gave the keynote. And it was, you know, the pod show was so cool. And, uh, and you know, we've seen a lot of things happening with video, and now I predict actual physical objects on the internet. So, you know, physical objects of the new internet, I guess. So this is a little story. This is Walt Disney's head. And 
you can get Walt Disney's head on a plate. And this guy, um, <laughs> why would you want that? It doesn't matter, it's there. This guy um, created it. I'm not sure how he did it, but he created it and he made, a, he made videos out of it. And he, made it, and he used it to animate it. You can actually move the eyes around and stuff. And um, my friend Zach, of course, got this file. And it wasn't really set up to be a physical object. There were holes in it. It didn't have an inside and an outside, which is manifold shapes. I'm getting technical here. But basically, he had to spend about a half an hour making it so that you could print it out. So then he printed it out. And there's Walt Disney inside a MakerBot with a little alfalfa hair where it does its final little lift up. And uh, interestingly enough, we had a party and we started printing it out. And in the middle of the party, somebody bumped it. <laughs> and uh, it kind of looks like Cthulhu is crawling out of his head, doesn't it? And, uh, but there was a guy there who does uh, medical imaging. And so he went home and uploaded his brain. Oh, no, it's a, it's a public domain MRI data set. Um, so it's somebody's brain. I don't know. Hope, uh, Frankenstein would probably care, but we don't. And uh, of course, immediately, somebody was like, oh my god, you should put this brain in Walt Disney's head. <laughs> and because it's all open source, people love putting stuff up in the public domain or creative commons, this is all possible. And so. Half an hour later, there's Walt Disney with his brain sticking out of his head. And I don't have a picture of it yet, but uh, somebody has, um, of course, somebody saw this and they're like, I'm going to make Walt Disney's head into an egg cup. <laughs> so now you can get his head printed out and then eat eggs out of his, where his brain should be. So this kind of gives you an idea of like how sharing can like connect to collaboration and the magic that can kind of happen. All these people were all over the world and yet they were inspired by each other and bounced things off. And this is kind of like, a, I guess, the 3D equivalent to a mashup. So it's, and it's magic. Like watching this unfold, because I, you know, Thingiverse as well also tweets. I should mention you can follow at Thingiverse. And whenever somebody uploads something, whenever a new object arrives on the internet, it'll say, hey, there's, you know, Walt Disney's egg cup head is on the internet. It'll just do that whenever it does that. Um, so one of the things is like, who gets these things? And a lot of people are like, oh, I can get that. That's very technical. But actually, anybody can get it. And it's kind of the, the other thing is like, a lot of people are like, oh, I couldn't make that. Chris said, oh, I, you're going to tell me I could make it if I wanted to. I'm a software guy. And I have to tell you, like, just as a, a matter of principle, like, if you want to make something or you want something to exist, like, you can, you can do it. It's, just, it's not a matter of knowing how. It's a matter of wanting to know and wanting it. And like, you know, for two years I made videos where at the beginning of the week I didn't know how to make something and by the end I had to make something and have made a video about it. And uh, you can do it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the people who make this in general are architects and designers and tinkerers, but it's also just ordinary people who want to live in the future. And I like those people. Uh, here's another story. This is Will Langford. And he's a really great guy. He bought a MakerBot, number 41. And we have a little page where everybody puts up a picture of their machine that when they make it. You can see there's actually a little one painted like a giraffe and one with a face on it. It eats plastic and barfs objects. And uh, Will, he got his machine, and he's uh, just gone into college. And so he's like, can I be an intern for the summer? And we were like, intern? Yes. <laughs> and. Uh, Turns out he's having a great summer. I put, we, uh, we, he, he developed the version 4 of the Frostruder, which is a frosting attachment you can add on here to automate the cupcake making process. <laughs> and um, it's totally fun. We'll, have a revision, we'll get like version 5 or 6 out, so, and when we get it so it's perfect, we'll sell kits. Until now, if you want one, all, you can go to svn.makerbot.com, and all our, all our things that don't work yet are right there, and you can download them all. <laughs> Um, so there he is, and now he's, he's, he's opened up an Etsy store where he sells things, and I don't think he's actually sold anything. I can't wait till somebody buys something, because it's, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's, first of all, he just, he's so excited, and uh, second of all, it's really cool that people are, he's going to build a business, he's going to go back to school, have this on top of his mini fridge, 
Whereas other students, he goes to, he's going to a school called Tufts, which is an engineering school. And uh, all the other kids at his school have to wait till they're seniors and they get their project approved to use the 3D printer. And he's just gonna have one. And everybody's, I, I predict his dorm room's gonna be popular. And he's 18, which is awesome. So uh, the, here are the glasses that he printed out on his machine. <laughs> Will is awesome. So our company is a little bit different. MakerBot Industries is a little bit different from kind of mainstream uh, manufacturers. Uh, we started in, at the beginning of the year, we'd been working on the RepRap project together for a while, which is a self-replicating rapid prototyping research project. And uh, we forked it because there's this whole thing with self-replicating machines where in order to have one, you need one. It's sort of chicken and egg problem. So we just decided to make the machine we could with the tools we had at hand. We, had a laser, we have a laser cutter, and, um, and we had a hardware store nearby, and we got started. Um, we had one hacker space, which I'll talk about in a second, two cases of ramen, three obsessive humans and four hours of sleep, bonus points for five cases of Club Mate, which is a really wonderful beverage we import from Germany. It's highly caffeinated. Um, so NYC Resistor is this place where we, me and Adam and Zach all met. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, a good chunk responsible for it existing, and I'm really proud of it. It's a, it's a hackerspace. If you haven't heard of a hackerspace, um, you can go to hackerspaces.org and see there's, there's hundreds of them in the world now, and you can see if there's one near you. Uh, and basically, it's, it's, a nerd, it's a nerd clubhouse. We have, oh, sorry about that. We've, uh, we've, we share um, ideas, we share experience, we share learning, and um, we share tools, bonus. And basically, it's really great to have a community of people where you can go and, um, sorry about that, that might have been me. And, uh, and if you have a problem, there's 25 other people that each have their own kung fu, and it's very likely somebody has kung fu similar to what you need, and will point you in the right direction. Uh, here we are. We just hired Marisol, who's the gal in red, and she's taking care of, like, she's the person organizing all the shipping, which is, I have to say, if you've ever organized, uh, if you've ever sold anything and then had to ship lots of them, it's a major undertaking. So most people do this the, like, black box proprietary way. They, they come up with an idea, they hide it, it might never see the light of day, and if it's a good enough idea, they'll spend a lot of money on it and make it perfect, and then eventually they'll release it a few years later, if at all. And we, we're, we, we just don't like that. So we wanted to, cult we, we're obsessive open sourcers, and we wanted to cultivate a community that would share things. So um, if you haven't ever been part of a project that's open source, I absolutely recommend it. Just uh, you know, start getting involved, get on the list if there's a mailing list, Start listening in, start figuring out how things are going, and if possible, just get into it and start join the you, you know start by joining the conversation. Or if you're desperate, if you're in a situation where like you need something to exist and there's something close, like let's say you're doing something you know that involves photos or photo sh you know that kind of thing. Well, you might need to use GIMP, which is a really great um, open source uh, photo manipulation tool, and then you can just change it, add a plug-in, do all those kind of things to make things happen. So sometimes if, you, if you're not, if you, uh, a great way to get involved in open source is absolute desperate need. So the cool thing about this with a machine is that the people who get it, <coughs> excuse me, can do way more than we can imagine with it. We have a really active mailing list and the recent batch of people, we just shipped out another 50 bots and the recent batch, there's this, long, there's this little thread basically saying, how can I make my machine Twitter? And sure enough, like somebody was like, "Oh, I'll write a G code extension for it." So now, at the end of uh, at the end of a, it's not it's not implemented yet, but it'll come out probably before the end of the year. Where at the end of making something, it'll be like, it'll Twitter. You can have a Twitter account, or it'll Twitter on your account. It'll be like, "I just made something. It was this big. I used this many CCs of material. It's awesome." Um, the other thing we did that um, uh, has really worked for us is we made sure that our community could connect to each other and to us. And we did that with Twitter. We check Twitter every day, and except some days there's a few days where we just have to pack boxes and not sleep. 
and we put together a Google group, which is a really easy way to do it. And we have a wiki that actually we use um, Wikidot, which has like forum stuff already integrated in and made it really easy. And the community participates in all sorts, like they just participate, that's just the way it is, because they're into it. And the other great thing is if any one of our community makes an improvement on the machine, or has an idea for something, they'll share it. And the cool thing is like, if one of them it comes up with an idea, everybody benefits, which is really obvious in an open source community, but in a physical way, it's like, if somebody comes up with a new attachment that can attach on here to extrude whatever, then everybody benefits. Um, like for example, so everybody's right now obsessed with putting an LCD screen on it. So we, you can like, the machine will have like a status update or tell you how much like percent, you don't, so you don't have to look at your computer to see how much is left and they're going on and on about that. And there's somebody who actually like, either has like done a lot of LCD design or is just completely, has been obsessed for a long time and is like, oh, use this one, use this one, use the other one. Which is like stuff that we would probably have had to spend weeks learning, but our community knows how to do it, so it's awesome. Um, we had, when we first started, one of the major things we had to overcome was what do we print on? We could extrude this ABS plastic, and it was a little bit sticky, but we couldn't figure out, it, but we could either make things, we could, we could put it on flat acrylic and it wouldn't stick very well, or we could put it on wood and it would stick so well that when you pulled it off, it would pull a bunch of the wood off with it. And we just, this was really, we were fighting with this. So we finally found foam core, which has this kind of like, it actually has a ceramic dust on it, I believe. And um, that was great, but it was a consumable and the, the oh, you're a champion. And so our friends, Marius and Philip came to town. They're from Vienna, they're with Metalab, uh, a hackerspace in Vienna. And they were like, Screw this with the, the foam core, it's like way too much waste. We don't wanna waste all this stuff. So they found a way to go back to using acrylic, but it has all these uh, lines in it that we laser cut into it that go in so that when the plastic goes in, it actually attaches and kind of goes into these little grooves and it works great. And now instead of shipping tons of foam core out, we just ship one of these plates with each machine. So, um, oh, I've got another little movie for you. This was made at like 4 a.m. We're guys here with my friends Marius and Philip, and they're here in New York on a hackcation. They're vacationing and hacking basically 24/7 here at NYC Resistor. And today something very exciting happened. We got black ABS plastic in the MakerBot store. What's black ABS plastic good for? <laughs> Printing evil stuff. <laughs> This is like four times speed. That's like 16 times speed. I think that's 64 times speed. That's really fast. So that's, that's actually the sound of the stepper motors. All right, it's all done. Check it out. It looks good. This is pretty much the ultimate thing to print out on MakerBot with black ABS. You can check it out. Get your own ABS plastic for your MakerBot. MakerBot.com. I want this special session operational. <laughs> yes, sir. I want this bat I love I want this battle station operational in five minutes. <laughs> I'd love saying that out loud. Um, so but this thing only works if people are willing to share. So this is sort of this thing, and it's we're just entering you know, we've kind of been entering this time for 
a few years now where people are getting this idea of sharing as an actual wonderful thing. We've sort of like been really, as a culture, we've been really proprietary for a long time and it's just sort of hitting an inflection point where sharing is gonna basically be a really strong force in the universe. And it only works though if people like are willing to do it. So um, coming up, we've got some exciting things. We've got, we're gonna do support material right now. You can make, uh, we have, you, can, you can only do overhangs of 45 degrees or so. Um, which is like, uh, it's, it's like you could make a martini glass, but making a wine glass where you had to come out and go like that would be a little bit tricky. You could do it upside down though, actually. Um, we're also, we're working on a 3D scanner that should be out next year where you'll be able to, that kind of makes the replicator kind of thing where you put an object in one side or your head and press a button and it just makes it in the other box. Um, we want to do a conveyor belt so we can go to sleep and wake up in the morning with tons of parts lying on the floor. Uh, like I said, our, our users are obsessed with getting an onboard display, so we're going to do that. And we have an SD card. We're really obsessed with being future compatible. And so we actually, when, we, you know, when Zach designed the electronics, he put an SD card on there, which isn't usable yet. But um, Adam, who's basically the software guy here, and on our team, he's working on basically, we need it for buffering actually now. And so basically at some point pretty soon, I won't have to attach this to my computer and I'll just be able to have like a number of SD cards, one that says like Darth Vader helmet, another one that says this, that, the other, and I'll just plug it in and it'll just go. Um, so, but like what's the long-term dream here? Like in five years, I would imagine if every single one of you had one of these things uh, and your mother too. And like, for example, maybe she wants to make cupcakes. And she's decided that normal cupcakes require, you know, one cup of sugar. But for her cupcakes, it's really best if, it, if it's 1.12 cups of sugar. So she finds either designs or downloads a, a measuring cup and scales it so it'll be exactly 1.12 cups of sugar. And, you know, it's right next to her microwave, so she prints it out and then she makes you cupcakes that taste really good. So that kind of thing can happen. And then she could share that and all of her friends could make the exact, you know, similar cupcakes. I'm kind of obsessed with cupcakes. Um, but the idea is like, it t if you take this farther, like for example, one of the things I have to do is, what my, uh, in New York we have horrible humidity. And I used to live here, but now I live in New York and it's so good to be back here, by the way. Um, and my air conditioning knob broke. It's one of those things that's kind of like a half moon. And uh, I'm just gonna, when I get home, I need half an hour to just design a knob with somebody, maybe somebody's face on it. And then I'll be able to turn their face and turn the air conditioning on. And then everybody will be able to turn their air conditioning on with somebody's face on it. And um, that's the kind of like, it's just, it's so cool to think about the possibilities. I mean, I'm just making stuff up here, but like if, you know, we think so often the way that we think of acquiring new things is shopping and going out and having to choose from different objects that people are having manufactured, usually from very far away that have to be transported to you. And this idea of instead of having to go shopping and spend your time in transportation and going to the store and spending your money on all the infrastructure that somebody else is doing, you can just go online, download what you need, print it out. And I love thinking about that near future. We're we're there, but it's not just not everyone is there. So, um, yeah, I'll, yeah. So you know when he you, when he's like guns, we need lots of guns. Um, this isn't necessarily like no. I, the closest anybody's come to that is somebody printed out a slingshot, but um, uh, it's not just like guns that you could get. In theory, you could be like spoons. We need lots of spoons. Um, other things that I'm looking forward to is like. Uh, uh, medical implications, uh, already 3D printers are being used to uh, print out scaffolding for bones to grow on. We, we're, we're pioneering this um, material called polylactic acid, PLA, which has just come out. It's made out of corn and it, uh, it can degrade in your body, I guess. Still learning more about it, trying to get, we, every time we do a batch, it costs us like $500 and so far we've done that twice and it all, it just like drips out. So there's a whole chemistry involved in getting it messing around and pioneering and getting that right. Um, I want a moon base. How many of you would go on vacation on the moon? I think that would be really cool. So I want to send probably your machines 
to the moon and then just have them use moon dust and whatever kind of stuff we can come up with to make a moon base. So when we get there, it's like, you know, airtight and we can just chill on the moon. So um, I invite you to get involved now. If nothing, you can follow along and enjoy the progress and enjoy the show of the drama that unfolds as we continue to make machines that make things. Um, we're selling batch seven is up, which ships October 5th, I believe. And of the 50 in that batch, there's two left. And then you'll have, there's one. Oh, oh yes. What's that? Uh, we'll put up batch eight in the next week. And then it should ship some uh, middle of October. <laughs> uh, if you're in an educational institution, I'll hook you up. Otherwise, I mean, right now, the way it is, uh, right now is basically, it's really interesting. I mean, this is my first real startup adventure, and, you know, we haven't paid ourselves for the last year. But because every machine that you get, you know, part of it goes towards the stuff. A small part goes towards our, we just moved into a new factory, so the rent for that. And then the rest of that actually goes to buy more machines so that more people can get them. It's kind of an adventure process of scaling and excitement where we're scaling as fast as we can and eating ramen like crazy. Um, so, and I love this idea that in the future, we won't be scared of sharing. We won't feel like it'll compromise ourselves. We won't feel like sharing what we love is, letting, is, is losing it. This is, um, this is my friend Martin. He uh, is from Berlin and he's visiting me. And uh, he at one point got his body scan in a body scanner. The German government decided they needed to know what size the average person was. And, um, and so they installed these, they sent out these body scanners around Germany so that, like, so that clothing people and these kind of things could figure out what the average sizes were and stuff. And they went over there and they managed to like, get their body scanned and then they sent them a blank CD and they sent the blank CD back. And so that's his body. He came over and we printed it out. And I think he's the first person to actually replicate himself, at least on a MakerBot. And uh, I, he was, you know, you can kind of see that he's wearing underwear there. And uh, I just want to um, say you're invited to participate and it's really a blast and fun and if nothing else, follow along and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Uh, do, I don't know, I haven't really been paying attention to time. Do I have time for questions? Five minutes. Five minutes for questions. So if I don't answer your question, I'm just going to go out in the, in the hall and just print stuff out for a good chunk of the afternoon. And you can just come and visit. But uh, questions? What was the, when you made the Darth Vader head? Yeah. Showed the time what was the actual run time? Oh, that was a 40 minute. And what, what's so cool about that is actually it was really hard to get a hold of a good Darth Vader like 3D model. but. Turns out the Lego community has an obsessed, they, there's Lego Darth Vader heads and that was based on one of those. And uh, there's a huge community that's very active that has super big fights about the exact dimensions of Legos. Lucas Gomez for money. What's that? Did Lucas Gomez for money? Uh, did Lucasfilm ask for money? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, they, what would they, why? Yeah, another question. Um, well, the, yeah, the question was, the question is, is uh, 3D printing sustainable? What do you do with the ones that don't work or the ones that break? And um, that's one of the things I really like about working with frosting is <laughs> when it doesn't work, you just eat it. Um, but with ABS, ABS, like one of the, we, the way we do ABS is you, you, we have a, a place that takes plastic and that you, um, Actually, little beads of plastic are measured in a Gaylord. That's the unit of measurement. And, uh, you, and then they're made into a filament. And one of our goals is to be able to make a recycler that would, you would take all your old stuff and it would probably, you'd probably put it in some sort of a blender. That's how I would do it. And then we would find a way to make it into a fil that you could make it into a filament. 
Another thing that we use is we've actually used HDPE, which is the same thing your milk jug is made out of. There's kind of some serious warping issues because it has some thermal properties of expansion so that when it cools down, it, it shrinks a little bit, which makes things warp. But um, wouldn't it be, uh, one of the things I want to do is make like an apple core for, uh, for milk jugs. And the cool thing is, is like, actually, I don't have to do this. Like, you can do, you, if, you, if you're on a mission to make, you have too many things and you want to recycle them, like, yeah, like, you can be that person that figures out how to, how to turn your milk jugs into other objects. Where do you see, uh, over here, support for being able to switch between multiple materials with the obvious one being like conductive to non-conductive to print circuit boards and that sort of thing? That's a really, so the question was, what are the options for different materials and what about conductive materials? Um, and I can say, in terms of other material, like being able to use multiple materials at the same time, that's on, the, that's on our agenda. I'm actually putting together a, a machine that's really long that I can put multiple machine heads on and try and do, and then switch between them. It's a little bit tricky since it, it's a little bit, it, the material is, is, you know, it's like a goopy liquid when it comes out. So switching is, there's gonna, there's gonna you know, there's research time involved in this, but it's on the agenda. Conductive materials has already happened in a really, not terribly impressive way. Uh, the RepRap community, which we're part of, um, somebody, made rep somebody printed out a, a circuit board that actually just had like channels, and then they melted solder into the channels. And even though solder has a high resistance, it actually worked as a circuit. So, because um, solder melts at a reasonable temperature, you could, in theory, extrude solder if you built a, if you want to pioneer that, that's yours. And you'll get, that'll be awesome. Yes, in the, in, the, in the back. So just one very quick point, not so much a question, but when I was in uh, college, I interned for a product design firm, and uh, the same basic process that you're talking about took uh, anywhere from a couple of months to deliver. Uh, the models were anywhere from fifteen dollars to $25,000, and only two people in our group were allowed to, literally allowed to touch them because they were so fragile. <laughs> so, you know, Talking about the going from the, uh, the the college room with the, you know single computer to you know what we have on their desk today, we really have gone gone pretty far. And so, congratulations on continuing to push that forward. Good job. Thank you. One of my favorite things to do is to take like an object and just you know throw it down. It's like you know, have you ever stepped on a Lego? They're really kind of they're really sturdy, and this is the same material. So it's like yeah, didn't do any like it's just great to be able to have a material that is be able to use ABS and. Yeah, I mean, we're in the most amazing, wonderful time where if you can imagine it, you, like, like literally, um, Dominic came over and was like, I uploaded my skull, and I was like, let's print it out. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I'm getting the time. Um, ask me your question later, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Great job. Great job. <laughs>